The very first pillar of Islam is the Shahada. The testification that there's no one worthy of worship except Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his final and last messenger. And then you get to Salah, that as Muslims we have five daily prayers. The next pillar of Islam is Zakah, is that once a year you will give out 2.5% of your wealth. Now you go to the month of Ramadan, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commands us to fast this whole month. And then the last pillar of Islam, going for Hajj. So you notice my brothers and sisters, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala throughout the pillars of Islam, He teaches us pillars of success. He teaches us how to be successful individuals. You just need to analyze and focus and you'll see you're able to extract those deeper and greater meanings. And this is the true meaning of the ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger when they call you to that which gives you life. That the pillars of Islam, the obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, these are the things that will bring you success, not only in the hereafter, but in this world as well. Allah is calling you, and it's up to you, will you answer that call or not? The very first pillar of Islam is the Shahada. Now what is the possible success that one can find in this statement? If you look at your own human psychology, you'll see that as human beings, we love to be in one of two positions. We strive to be in positions of authority, but we'll usually feel best when someone is authoritative to us. And you'll see that your success, your tranquility, your serenity, it lies in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People will work their whole lives and they will not find happiness. But the second they submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the second they submit to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is when they'll find happiness. I want to share with you the story of an individual named Abdullah. Abdullah is just your average Muslim. He lives in the United States. And one day, he was called into his office by the boss. And the boss told Abdullah, Abdullah, I have some good news for you. You've won employee of the year. Now Abdullah was just his regular self. He smiled and he was very happy and very cheerful. And the boss says, you know, before I give you this award, I want to ask you a question. And that question is, why are you always smiling? Why are you always happy? And Abdullah went on to say that, you know, boss, it's my religion that makes me happy. It's my religion that makes me smile all the time. I know that when God is watching over me, I have nothing to worry about. So the boss asked him, Abdullah, if I was to become Muslim, would I feel the same amount of happiness? Now most of you may think that I'm about to say yes, this is what Abdullah said and the boss became Muslim. But that's not the story. Abdullah said, no, you won't be as happy as me. And then the boss, believe it or not, he was actually heartbroken. He's like, what type of Muslim is this? He's supposed to say that, yes, you will be happy. And the boss was annoyed and frustrated. And then Abdullah, he stepped in and he said, boss, you would be even more happier. Because me as a Muslim, God, He forgives my sins from time to time. But you, if you were to accept Islam, you would become even more happier. Why? Because when you enter into Islam, God will forgive all of your sins. It is as if you were just born that day. Matthew was the boss at that time. He came to the masjid, he took his shahada, and he told, he shared his story with the masjid. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that as he's telling his, this story, he starts to break down into tears. He starts to break down into tears and he says, I have never felt more liberated. I have never felt more free than I find myself in submitting to the will and command of my creator. And this is human psychology, that when it comes to the creation of God, when they obey Him, when they submit to Him, that is when they find their true happiness. So in the first testament and the first testification that a Muslim takes that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah, that's where the happiness kicks in. Now the second part of that statement is that there is, uh, that Muhammad is his final and last messenger. That mankind may have this example that they may imitate and emulate 
that will build, bring them happiness in this world and in the hereafter. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed in the Messenger of Allah, do you have a great example for those who wish to meet Allah and the last day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Messenger so that he may be imitated and he may be emulated. Because naturally that's what we do as human beings. We like to copy other individuals. We like to copy other things. And this is what we just do. So in the Messenger of God, we see that we have that example of success and thus we follow it. And thus one of our psychological needs is met as well. And then you get to Salah. And when it comes to Salah, there are a lot of things that you can mention. But I'm going to mention something very simple to you. I was just talking to one of the brothers right now. And he was telling me that in the city of Dubai, about 50% of the people amongst the locals are struck with diabetes. And I find that really, really high. But I relate this to the concept of Salah, how and why. That as Muslims, we have five daily prayers. The first of them being Salat al-Fajr, 4.30 in the morning as it is in these days. This individual who wakes up at 4.30 in the morning, not only is he meant to freshen up, but he's also encouraged to walk to the masjid. Now what does this usually do to an individual? People who have diabetes, they're encouraged to do more exercise. They're encouraged to go out for walks. Likewise, you'll see something that's a very big common trend in the Muslim na nations and worlds is that all of our men for some reason are struck with high blood pressure. But if you were to just follow that simple technique, wake up in the morning for Salat al-Fajr and walk to the masjid, whether it's a five minute walk, a 10 minute walk, a 15 minute walk, those simple walks can change the way you think and the way you feel. And then you go to the masjid, why? Not for the sake of work, but for the sake of seeking closeness to your creator. And then Allah rewards you at that time. You have a head start on attaining your risk, on attaining your sustenance over the rest of the world. If you were to study Western demographics, most jobs, they start around nine o'clock. But when do the workers actually become productive? It's usually after lunchtime. So as human beings, it takes time to become more productive. So now you pray Salat al-Fajr, you're up for the rest of the day. You're going to start becoming productive at 7.30, 8 o'clock. While the rest of the people, they're still in bed, they're still dozing off. And this is another key element of success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted the Muslims. That waking up for Salat al-Fajr is another element of success. And when you focus on Salah, you'll see there's so many other things. Just the simple task of coming to the masjid. We like to go to social gatherings. Why? So we can network. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created natural networks for us. That when you go to the mosque, you go to the masjid, there are people that you will continuously run into. These are the same people that come to pray in the masjid. They will get to know who you are. They will get your phone numbers. They'll get to know your job. Every time they need to buy something, they can come to you. Every time you need help, you can go to them. And this is how natural networking takes place in Islam, simply by going to the masjid. The next pillar of Islam is zakah. And the month of Ramadan is when we like to give out zakah. Zakah is the charity that we give out. Most people, all they know about it is that once a year you will give out 2.5% of your wealth. Now Muslims have become so lazy that they don't even want to calculate the 2.5%. What they do is they'll take a portion of their wealth and they'll be, Ya Allah, okay, I'm giving this out in your sake. Hopefully it's enough. But you'll see, this is not what is required of a Muslim. Of a Muslim, he's actually meant to work out what he has. So you have to know what you have as an asset. What is it that is actually valuable? What is it that is bringing you money? Then you work out your liabilities, you deduct your liabilities. And then you figure out, are you at that level where Allah has blessed you to give out charity? I calculated in North America and it's roughly around $3,300. If you've had $3,300 in your bank account for one Hijri year, then it is compulsory upon you to give out 2.5% of that wealth. And if you haven't been blessed with that, then you're on the receiving end. But the point being, what are some of the elements of success that you find in giving out charity? The most obvious of them, you learn how to do math. Because as human beings, we're naturally very stingy people. We don't want to give out more than we have to. So we'll make sure we don't give out more than 2.5%. And the only way you're going to end up doing that is if you're very precise in your calculations. Then likewise, the modern Muslim 
he's going to have to look through bank charts and he'll have to look through stock charts. How much was the stock when I bought it? How much is it now? How much is it going to be when I sell it? All these things are taken into consideration. So he needs to have a financial background. Another element of success. Now the greatest element of success is bringing balance into the world. If you were to look into this world, you will see that there's a great dichotomy. There's a great division. And I believe Dubai is one of those places where you see it most openly and apparently. And that is the partition between the affluent and between the poverty struck. And zakah is the institution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established so that there may be a balance in society, that people may not have to resort to begging, people may not have to resort to stealing, that the responsibility of the affluent is to take care of those individuals who are not as fortunate as the affluent. So it creates a balance in this world that why instead of you know, only the, or the rich becoming richer with the economy, the poor become richer as well because the rich take that responsibility upon themselves. And you'll notice an interesting calculation that if you look into this magazine called Forbes magazine, Forbes magazine is basically a magazine that talks about the richest people in the world and their personal lives and how they attain that wealth. About 10% of those people were Muslim. Now if you were to take those 10% of people and calculate their zakat money, you would notice that it would be enough to eliminate poverty from some of the countries. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the ability to eradicate poverty if we just gave out this compulsory charity. And this is another element of success that you would find. Now you go to the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to fast this whole month. You will see that the underlying premise in this month is restraint and gratitude. That we restrain ourselves from food and drink so that we may recognize the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us but it has not bestowed upon 90% of the rest of the world. That we have the ability to drink and eat freely without worry as to where our next meal or our next drink will come from. This is a, th a concept that we need to be grateful for. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this month of Ramadan. That you restrain yourselves from food and drink so that you may be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these blessings that we take for granted every day. Now you can go to the health perspective as well. Just from an individual who goes from not fasting into fasting, you'll notice that your body starts going through cycles as well, in terms of its energy and in terms of its emotions. In terms of the energy, the first two days of fasting, all of a sudden you're ridiculously energetic. The masajid are jam-packed for taraweeh and you feel like you could take over the world. And then by the time you get to the middle, your energy goes down a little bit. And that's usually because, you know, you're having too many sambusas and too many pakoras and, you know, your digestive system just can't handle it anymore. But if you actually ate healthy food during that time, you'll see that the energy would stay constant. And then the last 10 days, you're energetic again. So that's from, you know, a health perspective. It's very healthy to fast. From an emotional standpoint, you'll notice the same thing that the healthier you are, the happier you'll feel as well. And the more unhealthy you are, the less happy you will feel. So in the month of Ramadan, when Muslims get happy for a few days, that's usually because they're the most healthiest during that time. And through fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about happiness as well. And then the last pillar of Islam, going for Hajj. Now, some of you may have gone for Hajj, some of you are planning to go for Hajj you will see that Hajj is the ultimate journey that a Muslim takes. He leaves behind his family, he spends a large amount of money, and he puts his body through the ultimate test. Now even through Hajj, you'll see that there are a lot of lessons and benefits that can be learned. But the greatest lesson I believe we find in Hajj is what it does to the believer. Is that I want to give you the example. An individual who goes to the gym, and he's only bench pressing 100 pounds his whole life. He's just bench pressing 100 pounds. Now a time will come where 100 pounds becomes so easy and he stops to grow. He'll get bored and he'll actually give up going to the gym. He's like, forget it, it's not worth it. But an individual who makes sacrifice and continues to grow, he starts off at 100, goes up to 120, 140, 150, and works his way up. He continues to grow, he continues to progress. Hajj is that ultimate challenge. 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you to the peak of your ability, to the peak of your sacrifice, sacrificing your family, sacrificing your wealth, sacrificing your body, going for, you know, the Safa and Marwa, going for the Tawaf, going to Mina and Arafah. All of these things require a lot of dedication and sacrifice. And the biggest part of your sacrifice is controlling your temper in the days of Hajj. When people are like pushing you all over, they're trampling you over. And that's when you grow as an individual. You are taught patience, you are taught gratitude, you are taught how to control your anger. All of those things come out of Hajj. The vast majority of people, they will live their lives and when they die, they're absolutely forgotten. If they're remembered, what are they remembered for? They're remembered for having a nice house, having a nice car. And you know, they might have done the odd thing here or there. But as a Muslim, this is not good enough. You want to leave a legacy of goodness behind you. A legacy that you leave behind and people will follow you an example so that you continue to grow in your reward. Fate rarely calls upon a people at a time of their choosing. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls upon you, when it's time to leave a legacy, it's not going to be at a time where it's convenient for you. It's not going to be at a time when you're absolutely free. But it's going to be a time where you're busy in this world. It's going to be a time when you'll have a lot of stresses on your mind. That is when you will be called to leave that legacy behind. And you'll notice the most practical example of this in the Khilaf of Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr became the first leader of the Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had just died. Abu Bakr had lost his best friend. He had lost his son-in-law. He had lost the leader of the Muslim nation. He had lost the judge of his society. He had lost his best friend. He had lost a brother. All those losses taking place to Abu Bakr. But Abu Bakr still stepped up on that mambar and took charge of the Muslim community. And this is the exact same call that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to all of us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with potential that we can leave these great legacies behind. Now some of you may say, but that was Abu Bakr, he lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I'm going to give you an example of one of the greatest legacies that was left behind. And this individual didn't meet the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is the legacy of the Negus, and Najashi, the king of Abyssinia. An individual who was born as a Christian. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa described him that no one in his kingdom is ever oppressed. That as a Christian king, he ruled with justice. And that was the legacy he left behind. And then later on, he did become Muslim, but he never met the Prophet ﷺ. Now I want you to focus on how was the news conveyed to the Prophet? How did the Prophet ﷺ find out that an Najashi, the Negus had passed away? Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said that today a righteous man has passed away. And then the Prophet ﷺ took that exact phrase and told his companions that pray upon your brother, for indeed today a righteous man has passed away. And the legacy he left behind was that of justice, that he knew the role that he had, and he did that role to the best of his ability. And when he excelled in it, that is when he left that great legacy behind. So right now in this room, each individual has something that they're good at. Hopefully it's the profession that you are in. That is what you are good at. Now take it to the next level. Excel in it and realize that the wealth that you are attaining through this job, if you're feeding your family through it, it is actually a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're giving your zakah through it, you're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're taking care of the needy and taking care of the people around you, you're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So indirectly through the job that you are doing, you're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just need to change your mindset. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the pillars to success through Islam. It's about time we opened our eyes and went back to the original sources of success, the Quran and the Sunnah. And when we analyze them and when we implement it, that is when Muslims will truly be successful.